a um, very good morning. So it's a lecture number four, and it's a week number five. So what we're going to do today is that we're going to spend the, pretty much the entire lecture uh, by discussing about how is a finite element method. And uh, as discussed a week ago, I know that you guys, or at least some of you guys, are already familiar with the finite element method. But still I want to spend a little bit of time, not necessarily an entire lecture, but quite a bit of time to explaining you what is the nature of a finite element method. Uh, that's uh, simply because a finite element method is very frequently used in a structural strength analysis. I'm sure you guys have seen those uh, uh, animations where there is a uh, like structure that looks like a little bit of fishing net, uh, which is experiencing different kind of loading condition, and then you can predict the deformation using the finite element method. So what's the what's the theory behind? So how is that you could do this? A deformation prediction, displacement de prediction, stress prediction based on finite element method. That's uh, what I would like to discuss uh, in details today. And we will get started by by looking at the very fundamentals in finite element method. And the very fundamentals is uh, how is a polynomial ex expansion that you can use to describe uh, a soul of a finite element. And then this uh, polynomial expansion will help us to describe the shape function. And once we get the shape function, then, uh, then we can start to, to be able to express the st uh, stiffness matrix and the mass matrix. And those are the components we in turn need to be able to describe the deformation in the framework of multi-body system dynamics. So that's what follows today. And uh, then next week, we're going to focus on Maybe this week or a little bit too, we're going to focus on the modern reduction technique. That's simply that we need to reduce the size of a typical finite element model. And uh, how is it we can do that with as little damage as possible to computational accuracy? That's what I'm going to discuss uh, over next week. And um, that's pretty much the, the most important material that you need to cover when uh, you're going to first uh, midterm exam. Okay, so with that, but uh, let's get started by first summarizing. And by the way, I need to put uh, my uh, YouTube studio ready so I can see if there's any comments. Uh, so before we jumping into the details of the final term method, let's shortly summarize what we discussed a week ago. And a week ago, we discussed about three-dimensional multi-body system dynamics. Uh, there was something that um, sounds like a little bit um, stuff that is not clo having close relation with us, but something that actually in a computation is super important. And, and that's the fact that uh, uh, you want to use a certain set of um, generalized coordinates to describe your body orientation. Uh, typically, your selection is something that is based on four parameters. Euler parameters is a very common choice, but it could be something else too, which is based on four parameters. And now, if you started to think about how is it you can describe your inertia properties, your inertia tensor, using these four parameters, that becomes to be super, super complicated, that almost like impossible thing to do. So the kind of the, the detouring that I introduced you a week ago was that we can build the relation between the generalized coordinates or velocity of generalized coordinates and angular velocity vector. And this relation is called matrix G mapping. And the matrix G is doing this, uh, this special thing for us, is, is, is relating angular velocity vector and time derivatives of uh, this uh, generalized coordinates, and these are the rotational generalized coordinates. And now, now how this is then important? Well, here it is where it comes to be handy. So this is uh, how, it, how are the generalized inertia forces. And generalized inertia forces consist of two components. There's a mass matrix, and then there's a quadratic velocity vector. And the mass matrix, the most kind of like the, the typical thing you have to have there is an inertia tensor. And of course, 
you would like to express your inertia tensor, which is the one that is shown here in the middle, by using your body reference coordinate system, because that makes sense. That's something that there's a clear physical interpretation of what it is. Yeah, you can go ahead and do so. And then with help of the G relation, you can, uh, you can express or you can kind of map these uh, inertia tensor, the whatever tenorized coordinates you selected to use. So that's that's the kind of the trick. So it's uh, this relation. Uh, oh my God! This uh, oh, well, let me take it off. That that was some some so comp so it was this relation. How the T actually works like. So, so that's that's the mapping you need. So T is converting um, angular velocity to be your generalized coordinates. That's what it is. Okay. And how is inertia tensor then? Well, inertia tensor consists of two different kind of components. So those are mass moment of inertia and mass product of inertia. Mass moment of inertia is always having the positive values. And those are located in a diagonal component here. And the off diagonal components are mass product of inertia. And those can have a positive or negative values depending depending always that you set it set in your body reference coordinate system. Okay. So that's about the three-dimensional multibody system dynamics. And then we moved to flexible multibody dynamics. And the first thing we discussed in the case of flexible multibody dynamics was how is that we dealing the amount of deformation? Are we dealing with the small deformation or large deformation? And basically, this categorization can be defined based on how is it you define the displacement strain relation? Displacement strain relation. What that means? Well, if you have a cantilever beam, you can describe the displacement of each one of the particles. That the displacement, let's call it as U. Now, how is it you compute strain based on this displacement? And how is it you define the relation between the strain and displacement? Is this relation to be linear or nonlinear? Generally speaking, most of the time that you're using a finite term and modeling, you are assuming this relation to be linear, meaning that you're limiting yourself to cases where the, the deformation is assumed to be small. Okay, what that means, deformation is assumed to be small. Well, that's a little hard to express in a general way, but basically it means that you are neglecting the second order deformation. What is the second order deformation there? Here it means, well in this case of cantilever beam, it means that the free end of the cantilever is staying in a loading line if you're neglecting the second order deformation. Whereas if you take that into account, then the loading line is no longer staying, I mean the free end is no longer staying in a loading line as it is the case in this scenario see here. This is where you're assuming the strain displacement in relation to, to be nonlinear. Uh, this is where you're describing the large deformation. What is the consequence of this large deformation? The consequence is the fact that in a conventional finite Tellman procedure, uh, your stiffness matrix is no longer linear, but it's nonlinear. And that uh, complicates things quite a bit because in your finite Tellman modeling, Basically, what you wanted to do is this. So you wanted to express the relation between the stiffness matrix and the displacement, which is ex no data. <laughs> so I'm back in, back in business. I guess that that was just a, a sudden disconnection. I got the very brief notice that there was a OBS disconnected, and then it, in a second, next second, it was back to be connected. So, so I guess it is okay now. Yeah, it looks okay. So it's an excellent connection again. Yeah. So I was about to explain this thing here. So I'm kind of jumping already um, a little bit ahead of the time, and I'm showing what is that you wanted to do in a finite term modeling. 
So in a finite element modeling, basically, so let me write this a bit to be more clear so such that you can all, all follow this. So in a finite element modeling, basically in the most conventional use of the finite element modeling, you have this relation. So you have here stiffness matrix, you have vector of nodal displacement, and external applied forces and if you do not understand this this time that's okay because we're going to refresh your mind regarding all these details and what you wanted to do here most of the cases is that you wanted to solve the displacement this guy here not a displacement and how is it you can do that well if this one here is a linear linear meaning that is describing more small deformation then it's very, very simple. So it's going to be just inverting the stiffness matrix and multiplied by external applied forces with that. So that's it. And then you can solve displacement. So that's the way to go. Then later, using the post-processing procedure, you can define from your displacement, you can define the strain. And for strain, again, using post-processing procedure, you can, displace this, uh, you can solve the stresses. So that's how the finite term modeling in short goes. Okay, but there's a quite a bit of stories like, how is the nature of this stiffness matrix? Before we can discuss about how is the nature of stiffness matrix, we need to take a look about how is the nature of the single element? Or what are the ingredients to build a single element? All right, anyways, so amount of deformation, are we discuss, discussing about the small or large deformation? That is defined by relation of displacement and strain. And now many of you may wonder, okay, so, um, all right, so that's uh, one relation. What about the second relation? This material nonlinearity. So if this is called geometrical nonlinearity, relation between the displacement and strain, then there's another nonlinearity, which is uh, material nonlinearity. But this is typically something we do not take into account in multi-body simulation. Why is that? Because we're speaking about the systems dynamically driven systems and it's not common that you have a plastic deformation in your dynamic system. Like an excavators and stuff, you might have a little bit of very, very local deformation, which is plastic, but big picture is still typically elastic. Okay, again, now, now remember displacement yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry that i keep on repeating this many times but this is super super important to understand because i see that very often people get confused so displacement is can be considered as amount of deformation and now relation between the displacement and strain this is uh, called geometrical nonlinearity, or maybe there is no nonlinearity, meaning that you're limiting your cell to small deformation then the next possible step is how is the relation between strain and stresses. This is a material nonlinearity. All right. Okay. And uh, what are the ways then to describe the deformable bodies? A week ago, we discussed that there is this method called lamp mass approach and the floating frame reference formulation as a big picture. And those are conceptually very, very different. And how they are conceptually different. Well, that's simply because in a lump mass approach, you're not actually using a different kinematics versus the flexible or rigid bodies. So the kinematics remain same all the time. And that's, uh, that's a great advantage in the sense that formulation or theory behind the concept is very simple, as there is actually no theory at all. So it's you just kind of applied rigid multi-body system dynamics in a slightly different way. A slightly different way, how that goes then? It goes such that you have, if you have an original body, typically a beam-like body, you define, you divide this original beam-like body to number of rigid bodies. And what you're going to do then between these bodies is that you introduce in the spring elements to all the six degrees of freedom. And that's it. Nothing else needed here. So uh, how you take that into account then? Well, you go into your equation of motion, you just add the number of bodies, you just add the number of external applied forces, that's it, no further actions needed. Whereas in a floating frame reference formulation, 
this is conceptually very different because here we're introducing the flexibility starting from the kinematics. And what we do then in a kinematics is that we will go back to the, our original description of a particle. And in the description of particle, we have here translation of the body reference coordinate system, orientation of the body reference coordinate system, and then vector u-bar. Now vector u-bar was constant when we were discussing about rigid multibody system dynamics. And now what we're going to do here is that we adding another component to vector u-bar. And this another component is description of flexibility. And obviously, this vector u-bar f, which is describing the flexibility, is a function of time, because the deformation can vary along the time. So that changed the game completely, completely. Because this is going to be then used to describe the equation of motion. An equation of motion will look very different when compared to rigid multibody system dynamics. Okay, so that's where we were. And now, where is this finite element model then? Where is that we need that? Well, we need that finite element description here, back to U bar F. So we need to describe deformation one way or another. A most convenient way to do so is by using a finite element modeling. And then you kind of, and this is of course very rough statement, but kind of, you can get the best parts of your finite element models. And the best part is that, that it's capable to describe the flexibility with a certain, you know, kind of easy way. And on the other hand, you can get the best part of multi-body system dynamics, which is capable to describe large rotations and large translation. These are the components that will do that job. So it's just combining them in a one package, and there it is. That's how it goes. Okay. So finite term modeling. So finite term modeling is approach that you dividing your problem to small elements. Each of those elements are an approximate of the solution. You keep on adding these approximates, you get the very accurate solution. And that's a typical nature of finite element procedure. Solution gets better and the better depending how many elements you're using. More elements, the better. So if you're using very coarse finite element mesh, this finite element division, I mean, dividing your structure to finite elements, that is called finite element mesh. So if your mesh is coarse, you're just using the few elements, your prediction is coarse as well. Whereas if you're using a lot of elements, your prediction gets better and the better. That's how it is. And now a typical finite element model is the one that is shown here. This, uh, this, uh, this picture here in upper left corner shows a two beam-like structures. And the one is a bigger than another. And how is it you can see that this is a finite element based modeling? Well, you see that because this structure here, this thicker beam like structure, is consisting of number of elements. So each of these kind of like pieces here are elements. Whereas there's another structure here that too is described by a finite element. So these are the beam elements. But this is a, what the um, finite element mesh is about. So that's just simply that you go and divide your structure by number of elements. So that's what it is. Uh, this, so let me play this video to you. So this was just a collision projection. So there's a thicker beam that is hitting their smaller beam. And this, of course, is a dynamic example because, you know, you see that these are moving and there's a collision here. Uh, there's a deformation. Now you see the deformation. So the thicker beam is uh, is clearly deforming here. So that's example of a finite term model. And now what we're going to do is that we're going to take a single element here, one element here, and we're going to start looking at how is the nature of this single element. Now we will get started by looking at something very simple something that is a kind of spring element. 
an element that can only have, you know, this longitudinal deformation, nothing else. And then once we're done with that, then we're going to take a look about the, the beam elements. And the beam elements are more complicated because those usually have um, rotational decrease of freedom and displacement as well. So that's, that's what we're going to do here. And during the course, or when we are looking at these simple uh, one-dimensional, one-dimensional elements, and these more complicated beam elements, we learn the nature of polynomial expansion and say functions. That's the plan. That's the plan. And we also gonna learn like what is the deal with the Pascal's triangle and a little bit about the convergence speed and uh, this kind of stuff. All right. So we started here. This was a slide that I introduced you a week ago. And in this slide, I'm introducing you a simple element which can be considered as a um, one decrease of freedom element. Why is this is a one decrease of freedom element? Because the displacement is only in a one line here. All right. Uh, well, let me correct that. Maybe that wasn't a good way to say it because, you know, this element itself consists of two nodes. Each of the nodes has a one degree of freedom. So in total, this system has a two degrees of freedom, but this is still a line element. So the only possible way this element can deform is that the, this node can move left and right, or these nodes can move left and right. Hopefully this clarifies. So this is an element, two nodes, node number one, node number two, and each of these elements, excuse me, nodes can move left and right. So that makes this as a two degrees of freedom system in a sense that, you know, these are the two different ways that it can move, but it can only move along the line, nothing else than along the line. So this element do not have the freedom to have a displacement in a transverse direction. That's not there. All right, sorry about that incorrect statement in the very beginning. All right, now two notes. Each of them has a one degree of freedom. How is that I can first express the soul of the element by using polynomial expansion? So what is this soul? Like what, what do you mean about this soul? In a soul, I mean that like how is it a life between these nodal displacement? How is that I can predicting particles? Again, we're here in the particles to move between these two extremes. And these extremes are not our locations. Well, the easiest way to do so is by assuming that there's a polynomial that can predict how is the particles. And remember, there's, all, again, infinite number of particles along the line of this uh, symbol element here. How is that I can predicting them to behave? And the easiest solution is that I'm going to use a symbol polynomial expansion as it is shown here. And in this polynomial expansion, I have a constant value, which is A0. This is my constant value. And then the value that depends on the parameter X. And the parameter X, so let me make this clear to you. So let me clear this a little bit from you. X is this longitudinal coordinate here. So those are, this is my polynomial expansion. And this is it. This is kind of it. So this is what I decided to use to predict how each of the particles between these nodal locations is assumed to behave. Is assumed to behave. All right. So I could solve the system by using this polynomial expansion. There is, however, a big problem. The big problem is that if I would use this polynomial expansion, my unknowns would be these polynomial coefficients, A0 and A1. And those have no clear physical interpretation. So it's possible to kind of give them a physical interpretation, but it's not obvious. But at the same time, I do have something that are having the clear physical interpretation. And what's that? That, of course, is my nodes here. A nodal displacement. A nodes, a nodal displacement. Hey, so what is uh, what is that I should do then? I should actually convert this polynomial expansion 
to be expressed by not all degrees of freedom. Why? Because then I can solve the problem related to these polynomial coefficients, which is so hard to understand what they are. So that would make sense to do it. So let's make it sense. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. So let's just take this polynomial expansion and let's express displacement by using nodal displacement. All right. So how this goes then? Well, it goes like this. Well, first of all, I'm going to express my previous equation by using two vectors. So I have my 1 and x, and then my unknown polynomial expansion. So keep in mind, this is what I'm kind of solving here. But I'm going to convert these unknowns to be expressed by using nodal displacement. So what is an information that I have? Well, if I go back to this figure here, and let me clear this one more time. I do know where these uh, nodes are located in the very beginning. So I know that node number one is located in a location where x is equal to zero, whereas in uh, node number two, that's uh, located in a place where x is equal to L. L is the one that is here. So those, that's an information that I have. So let's use that information then. OK, let's first substitute x equal to zero to, well, maybe I can write it again. So x a zero plus a one multiplied by x to this equation. Well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to submit this to this equation, obviously this is going to be the second component will be equal to zero. What is left is the first component. All right, so that's my first equation. Second substitution that I can do is this. So x is equal to L. So let's substitute this one here. You see, obviously, what happened is this one here. So it's going to be a1, excuse me, a0 plus a1 multiplied by L. OK, so that's where we are. Now, important thing here is that, you know, look what I started to have in here in the left-hand side of the equation. These are the nodal displacement. And then when collecting this expression such that I'm expressing the whole, whole, the same thing, again, by using matrices and vectors, this is what I can do. So I can say this is, these are my nodal displacement. This is like a matrix that relates the nodal displacement and my polynomial coefficients. All right. This is almost solved, almost. Because what I obviously need to do is that I need to solve this vector here. How can I solve that? By inverting this matrix and then multiplying, uh, when once inverted this matrix, then multiply that by this vector. This is how it looks. This is what I'm solving, this uh, polynomial coefficients. This is already, well, not yet inverted, but I suppose to invert that multiply by nodal displacement. And now this is now inverted version of that. Now, if I then go back, substitute that information to my original assumption of displacement. And look, this is now in entire span of the element. So this covers inner life of my element. So because this is describing every single particle between these nodes. So then I can get something that is called safe functions. I'm going to summarize this in a second. Now, he, this is it then. Finally, I can get my u, which is a function of x. So this is a continuous function. So this describes every single particle between this node and the this node. Every single one. Millions and millions of particles are all described, but not randomly but I'm just describing that there's a two different ways that these particles can move with, with each other. And these two different ways are expressed by these safe functions. This is my first safe function, and this is my second. And now here's where I'm trying to describe how these safe functions look like. And this is a confusing because I'm using a two-dimensional plot for a one-dimensional problem. So uh, try to... Try to just uh, 
pay a little bit of attention to understand this well. So this is just describing, you know, how is that? It's like this function here. So if I move, maybe the better way to say is if, if the particles are like discretized like this, and if I compress this node to move here, these particles between these nodes are moving linearly like shown in this picture here. The same way, if I take hold of this node here, move it left and right, particles will follow according to this linear distribution. So this linear distribution is very important. So this telling me, as a continuous function, how is each one of the particles moving as a function of nodal displacement. Okay, time to summarize. And this is important because all the finite elements, they have this kind of like inner life where we are assuming or where we're describing the particles between the nodal displacement. Every single one have this capability. And this is what tells how good is an element and tells what are the capabilities of the element. And that's why understanding this polynomial expansion and the safe function is at most important. So it's super important to understand what is this concept. And I see that I, for some reason I've been very slow today. It's already 10 to 9. So um, let me summarize shortly and then we move on to another element. Okay. I'm going to take these all the, all the way so, so make it easier. Oh, not this one. Okay. So here is my line element. Line element is an element that have two nodes, and these nodes are capable to move back and forth along the x-coordinate axis. No other degrees of freedom. So that's everything that this system can do. And I have two nodes here. Each of the node has a one degree of freedom. This direction or minus direction. This direction or minus direction. It's a one way that they can move. Because they have one, I mean, a total of two ways that the system can move. I can use the following polynomial expansion to express how the particles between these nodal locations is assumed to move. Now, what I would like to do with this polynomial expansion is that I would like to express these unknowns, polynomial coefficients, with help of my nodal displacement. And I can make it happen that by first expressing my continuous function, this polynomial, which is a continuous function, in such the way that I'm introducing the, the information that I have. And I have an information regarding how are the nodal locations in the very beginning, on its initial configuration, on elements initial configuration. I know that the first node is located in a position x equal to zero. I know that the second node is located in a position x equal to L. And once I have this, this information, I can build the relation between nodal displacement and polynomial coefficients. I'm solving polynomial coefficients from this equation. I'm substituting that to back to my kind of my original polynomial expansion. What happens is that I can get the description how the element behaves. How the element behaves, meaning how the particles between the nodes are moving as a function of nodal displacement. And in this case, it turned out to be that this motion is linear. So as described by these two bit confusing figures. That's it. This is pretty much this element. Then I have a bunch of um, kind of mechanical operations that I need to do to be able to express stiffness matrix and a mass matrix from this polynomial expansion. But that's very mechanical. So it's not uh, too complicated and should be something that you, you know, should not get too much confused with. Because this is, the, this is the most important thing. How is it you're predicting particles to behave? And now these particles, 
or the, in this element, more specifically, in these elements, the, the particles can behave two different ways because I can move either my node in the left or in the right, and that's the, that's the way that they can behave. Bit confusing, but still, that's how it goes. Now, back to this polynomial expansion. One more time, and I need to repeat this because the, what follows is my in-class quiz that will be available momentarily. So let me just to make my OBS ready for you. What happened to my OBS? Not OBS, but my soccer games. Just, just a second. So it was kind of frozen. Am I not locked into the system or? Okay. Okay, so what follows is that you need to listen to me next because I'm going to explain the material that you need to know when we're moving on to next in class quiz. Okay, so squeeze. You can, by the way, lock yourself into the system already this time because. Um, uh, so you see the how is a question. So you don't see that what are the different options because the options you need to take a look at the slides itself. Okay, so back to this slide here. One more time, this slide here. Now this is this was my polynomial expansion here. And like I said, you know the polynomials they can be selected as it is shown here. And this selection comes from actually comes from this uh, this famous thing which is this. Uh, um, Pascal's triangle. The Pascal's triangle, this is a two-dimensional Pascal's triangle. I'm going to explain what this means for us in a second. So, uh, uh, why, again, this is why third. Okay, these are the polynomials. So you see this is a triangle here. So now, it, once I have here two nodal degrees of freedom, in my system, uh, let me see if I, my my cameras. No, my camera is okay. I'm I was selecting this component and this component. Now, if I would add more nodal degrees of freedom, or no more nodes to these elements, meaning that there is a more like uh, control points. That's a not correct technical term, but you may consider those like more points. You can plot out the displacement you can then add more complex polynomial expansion. So let's say that I'm adding here one more node here. So this is then a three node element, one more node in the middle. This, this gives us a freedom to me to select one more polynomial component. And I could select this one here, but I could also select this one here. So this is where we're gonna go back. How is it you can do this selection? That is not so important, but what I would like to say here is that the number of polynomial coefficients have to be the same that the number of nodal degrees of freedom. So now if I have here two, no three nodes actually, I can use the polynomial expansion, which is this one here, a0, a1 multiplied by x plus a2 multiplied by x power two. If I would add one more node, so if there would be four nodes, then I can uh, have a polynomial expansion with the four components. That's how it goes. And now with that, let me move on to my first in-class quiz of the day. Uh, here's my pointer. Here's my first in-class quiz. Four node spring element, line element, read it as a line element, is depicted below, is described below polynomial expansion for the element could be. And now only one is correct. And how is that you can select the correct one? You need to take a look at the how many, what's the number of not a degrees of freedom. And that tells you how many unknown you can have in your polynomial coefficient. And with that, so game is on. Uh, let me see. So I have zero student. I already got the first answer in my circuit. So you guys are thinking about that. I don't know why that I'm very, very slow today. Maybe I feel talkative today. I don't know. Let me take a coffee to speed me up a bit. 
Hmm. Four answers. And I, um, when I check, oh, okay, so the game is on. So the first guess about the success rate is already in the chat window. Something super surprising that I learned during the weekend was that, you know, in chat, every now and then we got these weird comments from persons that I don't know. And these weird comments are actually links to a website that for sure will give you viruses. So uh, make sure that um, you don't click those those comments. This was a big surprise to me. I was not aware that there's just this some kind of a actions like that following I guess each one of the streaming. So it's like a, some kind of um, automated system that put these comments to that window. And if you accidentally click that, you're in trouble. Okay. So this is a number. So this makes sense. So this is no worries and no risk to click this. And I guess that there's nothing to click here. But anyways, make sure you are not clicking the ones that are having this weird text text that makes no sense okay and i got uh, 12 answers and i see that i have 14 yeah 14 13 now okay 13 viewers in my my stream it was a bit bit higher just a couple minutes back but we'll see 13 answers so we got uh, a total of six um guess is about the success rate my success rate guess is 75 so i'm gonna go with the 75 this is my my guess maybe i think it maybe will be higher because you know for some reason it seems that all the students in this class are well, all these outstanding students that seems to follow and seems to figure out everything with no no problem at all Okay, so now I got 14 answers. So let me put my circuit in the, in the window. So this is it. So what is a correct solution? So the correct solution is, of course, option D. Why? Because that's the only one where the match is the numbers. So the D is correct. Ooh. Ooh. And I got so scared, you know, I, 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 because you know this first one, first bar, I can't. It, I thought that it's going to go all the way to end, and it was close. It was very, very close. Okay, so the first option is not correct. Okay, this one should go like this. Okay, so uh, back to be excellent connection. No, it's still some kind of a problem. Mm-hmm. I only got one viewer, just one. I was, you know, what happened was that I, 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 I it's very unclear if you guys can hear me or not, because I could, well, let me, now that, now, now the number of viewers is going up again. So what happened to me was that I got the Windows problem. My Windows uh, completely was frozen, completely. So that's why I was have to restart my OBS. I was, you know, I did not eventually restart my computer, but the OBS was completely frozen, unwilling to cooperate with me. Okay, so we were in this this uh, this in class quiz. Uh, let me try to speed up here. I know that you guys are frustrating. Like, why is that I go this slow today? But you know, it doesn't really matter if we go slow here because this polynomial is expansion is a very very fundamental in the final term modeling. Rest, like I mentioned are mechanical mechanical which you cannot really you i mean of course you can you can fail there but uh but there's not that much to learn from th those mechanical operations whereas this polynomial expansion is like a fundamental okay so this element here consists of four degrees of freedom so there's a four nodes each of them has a one degree of freedom so it meaning that I have to use a poly or have to select a polynomial expansion where I have four unknowns. And again, these unknowns are these a0, a1, a2, a3. 
And what I wanted to do then is that I wanted to express these polynomial coefficients using my nodal degrees of freedom. And once I do that, I get my safe function. All right, so that's how it goes. And now what I will do next is that I'm simply going to take a look how is it I can express the stiffness matrix and maybe the mass matrix as well. I think that I will skip the mass matrix in the first element, but how is that I can get the stiffness matrix using my polynomial expansion? Like I say, this is very mechanical. This looks scary, but don't let this mathematics to confuse you because uh, this is actually very, very simple. You know, elastic forces, let's get, start, let's get started from that. Elastic forces in a general case can be obtained by integrating the stress over the volume of an element. Okay, so what that is, you know, don't, don't let that to confuse you again, but integrating the stress over the volume of the element. Stress, you know, there is this, you know, that there is this relation between stress and strain, like this. You know, you can, this is my elastic coefficient matrix of elastic coefficients, or just a scalar component, depending how what the dimension. So you're using this relation here, and this is how you can express the elastic forces. Elastic forces, like a spring forces, if you may. Now, Virtual work done by elastic forces. Well, that can be obtained by introducing the virtual displacement. The virtual displacement this time is going to be strain here, virtual strain. All right, virtual strain. I know that this virtual strain is a function of uh, displacement, like shown here. This allows me to use chain rule of differentiation. And when using the chain rule of differentiation, I can create the relation between delta strain and delta displacement and this is it and this is the mapping matrix again mapping matrix similar way that we learned to use that in a four course and total simulation of a mechatronic machine but again very very mechanical this this goes over and over again so this <laughs> this is my virtual work done by spring elements or the virtual work done by elastic forces and now what I will simply do is that <coughs> I will compute the different components here. I will first of all express the relation between strain and the displacement. And you see that this relation here, this down here, is linear relation. So I'm going to simply differentiate my displacement with respect to my coordinate x, longitudinal coordinate. And this gives me something which is, this matrix actually is called, typically called as a kinematic matrix. Sometimes in literature, denoted as a B matrix. So the kinematic matrix relates strain and displacement. You know, this is what we look in the very beginning. And this is what you, get, you can get by differentiating your safe functions. But again, don't put too much attention to that. But just again, you know, this is, this is how it goes. And you get this relation between strain and displacement. All right. So the rest of the components. So you can simply substitute everything you obtain from this previous slide to, I mean, not previous slide, but this slide to this uh, uh, virtual work done by elastic forces. And what you're going to get eventually is that you're going to get the volume integral where you have these kinematic matrices in the middle here. And then you have your elastic coefficient. Uh, when you do that mathematical operation, you're going to get the stiffness matrix. So this is how you stiff, how is your stiffness matrix? This time it's going to be two by two matrix. Now you may wonder, like, first I was spending that awful lot of time to explain about polynomial expansion. Now when I went to stiffness matrix, it all happened like fraction of the second like that. But that's okay, because like I say, once you get the safe function matrix. Now, once you get the polynomial expansion, then everything is very mechanical. How to get the safe function matrix, how to get the this kinematic matrix, how to get the stiffness matrix. Not much to think. Just use a symbolic mathematical tool and that's it. That's how it goes. By the way, in commercial finite term model or softwares, 
you know, they really don't have this kind of expression analytical form, but they're always expressing the stiffness matrix and other components numerically. We will get back to that a bit later, but they usually don't have this like a conventional way to express the matrices, which is analytical way. Okay, so that was my stiffness matrix. I can also take a look how is that I can express my external applied forces in terms of not a decrease of freedom. And when I do that, I'm kind of distributing my forces along the, that are applying in, along the element to not a decrease of freedom with help of safe function. So safe function again is playing very critical role. And once I get that, this is eventually how is my final Telman static equilibrium. So this shows the static equilibrium, which is like elastic forces equal than external applied forces. So that's what it is. Elastic forces multiply, ex I mean, equal than external applied forces. Now from this equation, you can solve the node decrease of freedom by converting the stiffness matrix and then multiplying this component, which let's just call it short as a F vector. And that's how you can solve the nodal dis displacement. And from nodal displacement, you can post processing or using the post processing procedure, you can get the strain. And for strain, you can get the stresses. That's, that's the procedure in short. And now let's take a look at the possible questions in this subject matter. And then we're gonna move on and look at something more complicated. Okay, the first question, explain how polynomials can be used in the approximation of displacement in finite, in finite Telman method. Explain also how safe functions can be derived from the polynomial expansion. All right, so we learned that already quite a bit. And we're gonna learn that another case as well when we look at the beam element in a, in a couple of minutes. But again, you selecting your polynomial coefficients from um, Pascal's triangle. And like I showed you earlier, so the Pascal's triangle can be written like this. And there is a story that is not mentioned yet regarding the Pascal's triangle. So let's make it like this. Let's write a few components like this. And then it goes, you know, that goes over as long as you want. So, uh, now this is a two-dimensional polynomial expansion, which is needed when you're dealing with the plate elements. Typically when you are using the beam elements, you're limiting yourself to this one dimension, which is this line here only. So it's just the, you know, the components along the, this line here. And you can go longer than just these four components. If you have more decrease of freedom, you can take more complicated polynomials into account. Whereas when you, using the plate elements, then you need to take also this other dimension into account, like the y direction. And when you have a solid element, then, you, then it is a, a true uh, three-dimensional representation, so you need to take x as well into account. But one of the things that's important regarding this tri Pascal's triangle, that you have to select this constant component and the first component. And why is that? Because if you're missing this component here, then your element is unable to describe a rigid body motion. Meaning that if you're placing your elements in different location in your space, it may introduce strains, which is of course unnatural. So of course your element should be, you should be able to place it in any orientation, any location without introducing any strain. And that can be guaranteed by selecting the first component. Second component, that too is important because that guarantees that element is capable to exhibit constant strain, which is a, a minimum requirement for convergency. And convergency, again, what that means, that means that you can get the correct solution by adding the number of elements. So if you're missing this component, your convergency may not be guaranteed. Then how you just you keep selecting the second, I mean, third and fourth component. This is a bit more complicated that we need to keep on discussing about that next week. So streaming should be okay now. Is the stream working? Yes. 
Yeah, it works. Okay. Yeah, so how to select these uh, more advanced components? Sometimes it doesn't make sense to select these components in a row, in the sense that you're going to take, let me change the color here. So it doesn't necessarily make sense that you select, you have to select this one, you have to select this one. But then the third one, you may select this one because sometimes it can speed up the convergency rate or improve the convergency rate when you do so. Okay, this is very complicated matter which we need to get back, but convergency, what that means. Let me shortly explain that to you. He's using this, uh, this um, kind of like drawings here. Um, let's say that you have a cantilever structure here like this. You loaded the cantilever structure by a force, <coughs> and then you know that there is a correct solution, the correct solution, which is uh, this displacement having a certain number. And now when we look at the situation, said so that this is a displacement. And this x-axis here is number of elements. So x-axis is a number of elements. So let's uh, let's take a look at this situation. Let's let's take a look how is your solution when you're using one element. So your ent entire structure is modeled by using one element. And your correct solution, I mean the analytical solution is the one that is this line here. So if you get the one, or if you're using one element, then <laughs> it's quite common that your solution is not yet converged, meaning that it's not reliable yet. So your solution is not what it's supposed to be, because you're using overly coarse finite element mesh. So when you're increasing the number of elements to be two, you're getting better solution. You, you see that you know, you're approaching the correct solution. Now, how fast you're approaching the correct solution? This is called convergency rate. So if you're really going very rapidly towards the correct solution, that's going to be the very good element where the convergency rate is high. Problem is that in the general case, you do not know what is a correct solution. So the only way to see whether or not your solution is converged is that you should compare to successive solutions based on the different number of elements. And if that remains to be same, then you can be guaranteed that your solution is converged. Now, if here, if you do the solution by using the one element and then by using second element, you see that they are introducing different solution. So the two or the solution based on the two elements is different than based on the one element. You see that this is not yet converged. So you need to keep on increasing the elements. Now you're using three elements, then you see that you know two to three is still increasing. So you you need to use at least three elements. But you don't know if this is already converged solution or not. Then you need to keep on increasing. And now if you compare the solution by using four elements, you see the solution based on the four and three el three and four elements are no longer changing, then you can be sure that this is converged solution. There is no other way to know that. This is how typically the elements behaving. Oh, look at that. By the way, I, we got these uh, links to, to some kind of virus site. So this is uh, Benjamin that was sending us an email hoping somebody to click this link. So don't click that. All right. So this is how typically the elements behave, but they can behave, the convergence can be, can be like this as well. And this could be the case. If you do not select this uh, polynomial expansion based on the order from the Pascal's triangle, and this could be a little bit problematic case because you can get the solution, let's say that they are fluctuating like this much. You can compute accident solution here and solution here and you see that there's no difference here. So you can make a conclusion that this is converged solution, whereas it's not yet converged solution. This is a little bit of special case, which is not happening often, but good to be aware of. Now, plate, no, not the plate, but the beam element. All right, the beam element, which clarifies what is the deal with these safe functions. So now this time I have 
B malum with the two nodes. Okay. Difference between the previous element is that now this time the nodal displacement, nodal decrease, are very different than they were in the previous case. Again, two nodes, node number one, node number two. Each of these nodes can have a displacement in global y direction, which is called as a v1 and a v2. So these are transverse displacement. And then there is a rotation from each of these nodal locations, theta1 and theta2. Now v1, theta1, v2, theta2 means that this system or this element has a, a total of four degrees of freedom, four different nodal displacement. Again, motion or displacement in y direction, this node, translation of this node, motion y direction of this node, rotation of this node. And now what we're going to do here is that um, we're going to build the relation between the rotational degrees of freedom and this transverse displacement. And we're simply assuming that this rotation or this equation is valid. And this is coming from the fact that if you if you think about the midline of the element, if they're behaving like that, so if you take a midline of the element, this is how you can get this angle theta here. So the midline is always assumed to be perpendicular. I'm sorry, that was an incorrect statement. So the cross section is always assumed to be perpendicular with respect to midline here. And when I'm making this kind of assumption, this is the way that I can express my rotational degrees of freedom. So it's a function, or it can be derived from this transverse displacement. Okay, now four degrees of freedom, so I can use my polynomial expansion, as it is shown here. So this is a little bit of small font, but I'm, I'm sure you guys are young and everything, so you can clearly see this. So, um, so I have polynomial expansion such that I have these two components that I used in a previous case, constant component, and then this um, component where I'm multiplying the a1 by x, but now I need to get additional one. Why? Because I, could, I have four degrees of freedom in my system here. So additional one is going to be a2 multiplied by x power 2, a3 multiplied by x, x power 3. All right, that's it. So this is my polynomial expansion. And again, I could, I could use these a's as my unknowns. I could solve my system by using this a1 to a3. But the problem is that they don't tell me much. They don't tell me much about how is a actual solution. They don't have a clear physical interpretation. They would eventually tell me how would be the displacement in the y direction. But other than that, those are really, really hard to use. So what I would like to do then is that I want to convert this expression to be expressed by using nodal decrease of freedom. Nodal decrease of freedom. Okay, same procedure than the last time. So I'm expressing this uh, equation by using two vectors, my unknowns and my polynomial components. All right. Then I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to substitute the information that I have to this equation. And the information that I have is my nodal locations. Let's go back here. So my, and uh, now this is a big mess here. You see that uh, x. All right, this is my x-axis. This is my x-axis. And it looked that the first node is located in a point where the x is equal to zero. Whereas the second node is obviously located in a point where x is equal to l. And then using this another notation, I could get the additional information. So I'm substituting the information x equal to zero, to this polynomial expansion. This will disappear, this will disappear, this will disappear. And this is what is left. And then I'm differentiating this one here with respect to x. And then substituting x is equal to zero. And this is what I'm going to get. And then I substitute in the x equal to l. And again, 
I'm going to do the substitution when I'm differentiating that. So these are the rotational degrees of freedom. All right. And now, then what follows is this. So these are my nodal degrees of freedom. Put it in a vector four. These are my polynomial unknowns. I'm going to convert this matrix here such that I can find the relation between these polynomial unknowns by my nodal displacement. And then I'm going to do the substitution back to this one here. And I'm going to get the safe functions. And here are the safe functions look like. So this is going to be my safe functions. Take a look. You know, the first safe function. Now this is very illustrative. Remember how it was. So I have two nodes. First node of degrees of freedom was a displacement in a y direction. So if I have a displacement in a y direction like this, this is how I'm assuming my all the particles to follow that displacement. So this is my assumption. This is how I'm assuming that what will happen internally in this element, internally in this element. And as you know, this is a continuous representation. So I kind of have to, I know each one of the particles, how they be forming. But in this way only. This way, this is the way that I can see how they perform. Look at this. You know, uh, this is a displacement in a y direction. Angle here, which is also in the nodal degrees of freedom, that's equal to zero. Displacement here, we that's equal to zero. And angle here too, that's equal to zero. So this is only introducing the displacement deformation to that one particular nodal degrees of freedom. Nothing else. So that's why these modes not mode, safe functions are orthogonal, so they are independent from each other. Uh, this is a nice mathematical feature as well. Second, you know, this is rotation in my first node. So the only one that is non-zero is this angle theta, because this displacement obviously is zero, displacement is obviously zero, and here the, the angle theta is zero as well. And same, but another node here. So this is my second node, and again, the way they're performing is like this. Okay, so now let me tell you a story about my my career. So um, um, when I have, when I got my doctor degree, I spent my do postdoctoral period in in a university. That it was. The, let me see if I have a. No, I don't have a connection problem. I was. I spent my postdoctoral period in a university of of University of Illinois at Chicago, UIC. And uh, my supervisor in UIC was a super famous professor, still very active professor, Ahmed Chabana. And now if you look at the books, the most famous books about multi-body system dynamics, they're all written by, by Professor Chabana. So Chabana, so he's like more like a father figure of multi-body system dynamics. So uh, if you make a list about most famous professors in a field of multi-body system dynamics, first comes uh, Ahmed Chabana, then comes nothing, and slowly others. So he's in his own league. So he's super famous. Anyway, so I, I started there. The first assignment that I received was to create the safe functions for a played element, very special played element, because you know this played element was more complicated than usually. The plate element was such that, you know, first of all, the plate element looked like, let me go back here. So the plate element was a four node plate element like this. So there were four nodes. So node number one, node number two, node number three, node number four. So four nodes. And each of these nodes had 12 coordinates, 12 degrees of freedom. So that was very unusual played element. So that makes a total of 84 degrees of freedom. Meaning that this mapping matrix or this matrix, this one here, that relates the polynomial expansion and not a degrees of freedom. You know, this vector here was a 48 components. This was a 48 components. And this matrix obviously was a 48 multiplied by 48. And my assignment was to create safe functions. And what you need to do when you do that, 
is you need to convert this matrix, which is 48 times 48. Okay, so that's uh, not so difficult because uh, you can always use a symbolic math tool to do the to to do the computing. So it's not that big deal. But there was a major problem, and the major problem was the fact that no matter what kind of uh, polynomial expansion I was using, always when I was converting this matrix, it was singular, always singular. So what happened to me then was that I honestly I spent I think at least two months in my life, maybe it was three months in my life, to building this matrix 48 times 48, hundreds of different times, you know, different kind of polynomial expansion, another set of polynomial expansion, and always singular, always unable to convert it, always, always, always. And I was starting to lose my hope. And then I finally, I create like automated way to select the different, different uh, polynomial expansion. And then one day I was able to invert it. And we were able to make a paper which was uh, telling like how is this very special plate element dedicated or specially designed for multi-body applications. But I have spent quite a bit of time in my life to convert these matrices. And every now and then I still have a nightmare about this uh, mapping. So, so you guys just need to spend, what is it, 45 minutes in your life to listen how he is to convert that, but uh, for me it was a much bigger story than that. So, with that, we're moving on. Like I said, oh, oh, hold on. Like I said, this time I was selecting this uh, polynomial expansion. So that's the way that it was this constant, x, x power 2, x power 3 in a row. But I could, like I say, I could select such so that I could take, this is a mandatory component, this is a mandatory component, but the second, I mean third and the fourth, I could select it differently. So not necessarily take this one and this one, how this will change the game. This will would change the way the polynomial is expressed. So if I would like just to demonstrate how it works, this is a polynomial expansion that you know, look how I did the selection. Selection is different than it was. So I'm this time selecting the components like this. So I'm selecting this one, of course, this one, of course, but then I'm ignoring this one. And again, selecting this one, ignoring this one, and selecting this one. Okay, so what's the difference then? Well, you see that when I compute the polynomials, the polynomials look slightly different. This look, looks like this different then. And when you look at these polynomials, they, you may not see any differences at all when you compare that in a previous slide. But when I put it in the same slide, you can see that there is a, you know, they look slightly different. So I'm predicting different inner life of an element. A different inner life, you can see it here. So this is a polynomial expansion using the, the I mean, safe functions that I'm using, the polynomial expansion, such that everything is selected as they're supposed to be selected. And this is where it's like a different selection. Now, which one is better then? That's a difficult question. Because um, it's sometimes, uh, you know, first of all, when you're using this kind of selection, you can say that these elements are non-confirming elements. And there's sometimes there's non-confirming elements, not always, but sometimes they ex exhibiting, they're capable to express, or they're capable to have faster convergency rate than using these confirming elements, where you're selecting these polynomials, you know, just in an order like you're supposed to select it. So sometimes, if going back to this uh, convergency picture here, sometimes you can get the faster convergency like this. Whereas when you're using confirming elements, it could be slower convergence. But again, you need to be a little bit careful what to select. Sometimes it makes sense to do that. And there's no rules other than selecting this one and this one. Rest is up to you. So you can get some special features or you can get the lower convergence. Depends a little bit about the cases. All right, let's get back to my questions. Uh, explain the polynomials, how polynomials can be used in the approximation of displacement in finite elements. 
okay, I think that you got the point. So the polynomials are like basics. They're like soul of a finite sum. What you then do is that you first of all selecting the polynomial sets that polynomial components match the number of degrees of freedom in your element. And once you make that, then you're expressing your polynomial unknowns by using not a degrees of freedom. You get the same function. That's what happens. How is it you can selecting these polynomial coefficients? You can select that by using a Pascal's triangle. And in the Pascal's triangle, which again is like this, you may, ah, uh, this is x. You may or may not selecting the components in a row. So you can get some uh, better convergences sometimes if you're not necessarily selecting them in a row. So if you have like three elements with the three degrees of freedom, so you can select this one, this one, and the third one, you could select this one, or you can get some higher order elements. You can get more complicated deformation modes. Sometimes it helps and you can get the non-confirming elements. So if you want to learn more about non-confirming elements, this, by the way, is supposed to be three. Okay, you can take a look at the finite element literature. What the convergence rate means in finite element method, it means like how fast you can, con you can get the acceptable solution, meaning that two solutions, when you increase in the number of elements, two solutions are no longer improving the solution. And this is the only way to see whether or not your solution is converged. So meaning that you do two different kind of meshes, finer and coarser, and then if they give in the same solution, you can use a core mesh. All right, now, if you want to take a look, so let me see, I have nine minutes left. Do I have any comments? Not really. I see that I was unable to go to the modal reduction technique today, but, uh, or maybe I can, maybe I can. Okay, now in the case of beam elements, how is that I can, uh, I can uh, express my stiffness matrix? The few things that is important is that I, first of all, need to relate my displacement in a y direction to my, my, uh, displacement, which is like a displacement in the x direction. So this is how the relation goes. And this is definitely, this is just based on the, how is a cross section, how the cross section is uh, rotated. So, so let me try to describe this to you. So it's, uh, let me see, it will be maybe better to do it like this. So, so the displacement is, is described by using this rotation degrees of freedom. And then how far off you are from the midline? So the midline is the one that is, okay, let me try to make a better drawing to you. I'm gonna use a different color. So the midline is the one that is this one here. And then uh, I'm gonna change the color to be this one. And then I'm, you know, looking at how is the displacement. And the displacement is always based on how far off from you are from the midline. Now, and the displacement is in this, wider U direction here. Now, when you have a midline such the way that there is no deformation here, there's no strain either. So it, this is how it looks. This midline, excuse me, the cross section is always assumed to be perpendicular with respect to midline. This means that I'm dealing with the elements that are unable to describe with the transverse shear deformation. Transverse shear deformation is something that I shortly gonna explain to you in the very end of the course. So it's, um, it's just that one kind of element and this transverse shear is something that becomes to be important when you're dealing with the thick elements. All right, so this is in the beginning, so there's no strain. But here you see that definitely there's a strain here because if originally this cross section was like this, now it is like this, how much it is, there is a strain here? Well, this is the kind of the one that is telling the angle here, this one here, and far off you go from the U, higher strain you go. And this is why the U is here. So that's that's the mechanism behind. Again, you're using this relation to describe the displacement and the strain. And this is uh, what relates those two, those two things are called kinematic matrix. Kinematic matrix, and as I mentioned, kinematic matrix in the finite element literature typically is denoted by, by matrix 
or vector B. All right, so this is how you then calculate the stiffness matrix. So no thinking actually, so it's just a pure um, mechanical work you can conduct by using a symbolic math tool. And then if you want, you could also the compute this uh, mass matrix. And the, one of the ways you can compute the mass matrix is that you can use a, a consistent mass matrix. That's the way that you multi you compute it by using that say functions. So, and then the, the mass matrix is going to be a full matrix, not just the diagonal representation, but where the inertia or the mass is divided based on the safe function. All right, so let me start preparing yours to, I mean, our cell to lecture that's going to be next Monday morning. This is eventually then how is a equation of motion based on the finite term and modeling, how that look like. So I have here inertia forces, elastic forces, and external applied forces. All right, and what I need to do here when I'm solving the dynamics is that I need to solve this um, acceleration, like shown here, by putting everything in a, every other component in the right hand side of the equation. And then by using a need ready process, I can uh, integrate um, velocity and then I can integrate uh, uh, also the position, which is a displacement using this e equation. And what we're going to get then eventually is going to be this vector u bar f, the one that is needed to describe this deformation as a function of time. This is not going to fly. This is not going to work out. And why not? Well, think about the usual finite element model. The usual finite element model can easily have 10,000 degrees of freedom. 100,000 degrees of freedom, meaning that the, that this vector of unknowns, this vector u bar here, consists of 100,000 or 10,000 unknowns, and you need to solve 10,000 equations every single time step to figure out what's the u bar f. Whereas the reference motion then is described by using six coordinates, seven coordinates, depending how is that you're describing your reference motion. So think about seven versus 100,000. No, that's not going to work out. So this is not going to be possible to use it like that. Seven versus 100,000. You have to do something to your finite term model. And what you need to do your finite term model is that you need to reduce its size. You need to make it smaller because this is computational just too heavy to be used in any of the practical cases. So you cannot use finite element models as they are. And what you need to do then is that you need to look at the feature of your finite element model. You need to kind of be able to extract the most critical, the most important features of your finite element models. And then you're going to use those. And that's going to be something that is called this modal reduction. Like I said here, you know, this, like, like it is mentioned here, Typical finite term model is too large to be solved like using this direct method. This is called direct method where you do not make any model reduction, but you're just integrating every single unknowns as they are. This is going to be hard to be used in the framework of multi-body system dynamics because of the dimensions. So what are you going to do then? You're reducing the problem. And you're reducing the problem by moving from nodal coordinates to be something that is called modal coordinates. Let me repeat it. Nodal to modal. So it's like you're looking at the feature of your finite term model, and based on those features, you're reducing the size of the problem. And that's what's going to follow next week, Monday. So we're going to move from nodal space to modal space. And uh, this is going to be a super interesting trip. Uh, this is where we're going to take a look at the conventional vibration theory. We're going to look at the Aiken value problem, Aiken values, um, Aiken vectors, what they are representing us, what is, uh, how is that you can solve their structural vibration problems. This is what we're going to do next week, Monday. And these are the questions.
physical interpretation of Aiken vector, physical interpretation of Aiken value, how to conduct an Aiken value analysis, mass normalization of Aiken vectors. This is not so exciting, but this is exciting. This is exciting. This too is quite exciting as well. So that's what happens in uh, next week, uh, Monday. And with that, it's um, 9.45, time to do something else. So you guys, make sure you come next week because this is definitely something that I'm going to ask in the next midterm exam because the model reduction is a very, very fundamental concept. So stay tuned. Uh, and also, the next week, uh, Monday, there's going to be, not this week, but the next week, there's going to be, after, after uh, 9.45, there will be another half an hour lecture about the career counseling. This time, the career counseling will deal with uh, how is a life in academia. So, see you next week, uh, Monday then. All right.